and welcome to The Spectrum Show. Coming up in this episode, we get all the news and top selling games from December 1989. I review the Div MMC in Joy Pro 1. I play some games, have a chat to Jeff, and end with some demos. But first, here's the news. Well, wow, this is embarrassing. News is very thin on the ground this month. Most magazines are covering the Sam Coupe and shouting about how good it is, forgetting the good old Spectrum users. The little bits we have, though, are Demark are announcing a new coin-up conversion in the form of Stun Runner, System 3 are to release a remix of Last Ninja 2, and the sequel to Carry Command, named Battle Command, will be released soon as well. Talking of coin-ops, Activision have picked up the license to Dragon Breed, so that should be in the shop soon as well, and the sequel to Heroes of La Lance, namely Dragons of Flame, is on the way from US Gold. So it seems, really, it's all software news, and things are definitely slowing down for the spectrum. The magazines seem to be focusing their content on their respective cover tapes, trying to outdo each other, while at the same time getting thinner and thinner. Well, that wasn't the news, and now on to the top-selling games. At number 5 is Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade from US Gold. At number 4, Crazy Cars 2 from Titus. At 3, Shinobi from Virgin. At 2, Robocop from Ocean. And number 1, Batman the Movie from Ocean. And that was the news and top selling games from December 1989. This is not a promotion. I bought the hardware for myself to review it for the show. There are many modern storage options for the ZX Spectrum and I have quite a few of them myself. There's the full-size Div IDE, which I don't have. There's the Div IDE 2K, which I do, and is permanently plugged into my Plus 2. There's the Interface 1Biz, and of course the Smart Card, plus a few others. There are ones though that I've not mentioned here, and I think it's about time I did. I haven't mentioned the Div MMC Enjoy Pro 1, so let's do that. The Div MMC Enjoy Pro 1 it's a new device and can be obtained from Byte Delight in several forms. There's the light version that looks like the 2K one mentioned earlier and has no joystick port or case. And at the upper end is the Div MMC Enjoy Pro, the full one, and this is the one that I got. The unit comes in a rather nice case, well suited to any model of the Spectrum. It came supplied with a pre-populated SD card, but we'll get onto adding your own things later. First though, let's run through the details. The unit has two SD card slots, and this could be useful if you want to have one card with games on and another card to use as save games. This card lets you write back from the Spectrum direct, so for things like saving out letters on a word processor, or in fact saving snapshots of games you're playing, then this is ideal. You may have noticed the lack of jumpers to set the model of Spectrum being used, and that's because there aren't any at all. It's completely plug and play, and it detects which model is being used, and just works. It also has a full pass-through port, so you can use it with other devices, for example the ZX HD, an interface I will be reviewing shortly. It even works on non-standard models, even the Portuguese 2048. And yes, this is my machine, so I can confirm that it works fine. The eagle-eyed of you would have spotted small dip switches on the side, and these are used to disable the firmware for updates and to set the joystick ports. There are two of these joystick ports, and these can be configured in various states, including Kempston, Sinclair 1, Sinclair 2, and Fuller. The unit will also detect any other cards with joystick ports, or even built-in ones on the Plus 2 and Plus 3, and disable or reconfigure its own to avoid conflicts. You can even have a Plus 2 and 3 set up with four joysticks if you want, with the machine supporting Sinclair 1 and 2, and the Div MMC set for Fuller and Kempston. There are two buttons on top, one acts as a reset, and one is an NMI button. The reset uh, resets the spectrum, obviously, and the NMI drops you into the file browser. The Div MMC comes with XDOS installed, and has a built-in file browser for basic use and game selection. 
Exodus, though, is a full system in itself, with many additional basic commands for opening tape files, loading and saving, creating folders, and renaming things. It can be used, for example, with word processors, where one tape can be the loaded program, and the other tape can be used to save files. And because it's emulating a real tape, existing programs will work fine. The tape out command sets the tape file that all save operations will use, and once set for a specific operation, for example word processing, it will remain available. When I started using this command it took me back to using real tapes and having to load each program in sequence to see what was on it. The device uses both standard commands such as cat to get a view of contents of the folder and exodus commands such as tape in to set the tape file ready for loading. There are equivalents, for example .ls will show you the contents of the folder similar to the cat command but it's a lot easier to type than cat. The file browser is easy to use. You just press the NMI button, that's the blue one, and this will drop you straight into the current folder of the card. If you've been browsing before, either using this route or by Exodus commands, the browser will start in that folder. From here you can move up and down using the cursor keys, select folders, and select the file you want to load. The program will load automatically, no need to type load here or anything like that. The Div MMC Enjoy Pro 1 supports SNA files, TAP files, Z80 files and SCR screenshot files. It has limited support for TRD files but the missing format here is TZX, which the unit does not support. To get files onto the card, you just plug it into your computer and drag the files or folders across. Saving a snapshot of a game is easy. You play the game to the point you want to save. You press the NMI button, you navigate to the folder where you want the file to be saved out to, and you press the S key, and the snapshot will be saved with an auto increment in number. Sadly, it doesn't allow you to name the file, but you can go back in later and use the .mv command to rename it. If you don't do that though, you'll have a lot of snap files in the same directory, just called snap 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and onwards, with no idea of what they are. To load it back in, you just select it through the file browser as normal and load it in. Overall, this is a great box of tricks. It looks great and works really well. The jumpless design means I can use it on all my machines without trying to remember the settings. The right functions of XDOS mean things like saving word processor files or screens for testing printers are so much easier. And the full pass-through port means I won't have problems with other interfaces. A great modern storage card then, and one that is highly recommended. <laughs>
Control is good, but it's sometimes a bit tricky to work out which bits of the scenery you can walk over and which block you, and this can lead to unnecessary deaths. You have two weapons at your disposal, a machine gun and some grenades. You can pick up more grenades as you progress through the game. Grenades are needed to take out enemy gun positions or groups of enemy soldiers that are hiding behind rocks. The graphics are very nice and the scrolling is smooth too and the game really does look good. Difficulty wise it's not bad really, forgiving enough to get a decent way through and challenging enough to make you want to try again. Like the arcade you can commandeer tanks and trundle along causing havoc. The demos of the game that are available have different level layouts, so after playing through the demo a few times and then moving to the proper game was a bit of a surprise. An interesting note is that the game was previewed two years before release by several magazines, with the author being named as David Perry. However, upon actual release, the game was credited to David Shear. As yet, no one really knows why there was a delay or why the game seems to have been rewritten. Maybe another one of Elite's mishaps that keeps befalling the company, like the famous Scooby-Doo saga. Anyway, if you're a fan of run and gun games, then this, as much as it pains me to say this about Elite, is not a bad offering. Certainly playable considering the constraints of the machine, and worth a play if you feel the urge to run up a field and shoot things. This is Panama Joe, released by Parker under the Sinclair label in 1984, and this game has an interesting history. Initially released as Montezuma's Revenge on many 8-bit platforms in 1984, including the Atari series, ColecoVision and Commodore 64, the Spectrum version went through a bit of a farce. It was meant to be released on cartridge for Interface 2, and Parker announced this in several magazines. They more or less completed the game, with two versions eventually leaking out as prototypes. Then Parker pulled out of the ROM market altogether, leaving many unfinished titles, and I covered these in a previous episode. Sinclair took this title, changed its name to Panama Joe, and released it on cassette. The game is a simple platform exploration game that definitely looks like it was released in 1984. Having said that, the game is nice to play with some unique elements. The main character can climb up and down ladders, but only slide down poles. There are doors that require keys to be collected, to allow access to other levels, and these have to be the same colour. You can also collect swords that allow you to kill snakes or skulls that are roaming around. There are ropes to climb up and down and vanishing floors, so quite a lot to contend with. Making your way around can sometimes be very easy, just a single pathway from left to right, and maybe one skull bouncing about. It can also be sometimes very hard with multiple vanishing floors, conveyor belts, ropes and bouncing enemies. Each item you collect is shown on the top of the screen, so you know what you have, and the aim is to reach Montezuma's chamber and destroy him. Yes, they still kept the same name for the end of Game Boss. The graphics, as you can see, are very 1984, although they do move smoother than the usual 8 pixel character jumps of early games. Sound is very limited too, with a little tune that plays when you collect anything, and a sound for opening a door or dying. The game stops as well to play these sounds, which feels very odd midway through a jump when you're collecting a key. The game map isn't too large, so mapping is easy, or you can just look online. Interestingly, the ROM game had to be 16k to fit into the limited space, 
but the cassette release states you need a 48K machine, despite the game code only being 10K. However, having tried it on a 16K machine, it doesn't work. It's quite an enjoyable little game, and will pass quite a few minutes if you want a little platform runabout. There are many better games than this, released around the same time. But then again, there are plenty of ones that are worse. Why not give it a try? This is Booty the Remake, released in 2019 by Salva Cantero. I briefly covered this a few episodes back, but I thought I'd dig a little bit deeper because this is really a good game. It's a remake of the 1984 game by John F. Kane, obviously, and one that many gamers will remember. You have to collect keys to open doors and make your way through the ship collecting treasure. Each key has a number on it, and that opens the corresponding door. If you collect enough treasure, a golden key will appear randomly, which will allow you to escape and move on to the next ship. The game sticks to the original, which I like, and it has updated graphics and sound, which I also like. The backgrounds are textured, which can sometimes get in the way, but overall this is a great remake. random bombs when you collect treasure, moving platforms, and neat little touches here and there. I particularly like the cogs under the moving platforms. It has a nice tune playing throughout, and I enjoyed replaying this game, visiting memorable rooms, jumping on lifts and dodging pirates. A really great remake then, and definitely one to try. So this month's topic is Easter Eggs in Spectrum Games, which I believe was a Patreon request. It was, it was, and at first I thought I can't think of any Easter Eggs, really, and you were the same, but then I remembered a whole list of them that I'd found on the internet, and picked a few out and went through the entire list, and there are a lot of them, but they sort of can be categorised into um, loading screen messages and hidden messages in code, and then there are the other things which are a little bit more interesting to look at really yeah i'm not sure if i count hidden messages in code as easter eggs because it's nothing you could find in the game and there are other ones listed on that site that you mentioned i i'm not even sure count as easter eggs so kind of initials and things in game design in level designing games so bound to have like, it like um, ant attack and that sort of thing yeah ant attack and bounder are the two that spring to mind I mean, yeah. the fact that level one has high written on it in Bounder is just, well, it just does. Yeah, so let, let's let's pick out some that we think are interesting. Let's start with what happens when you press break in a lot of games. Um, some games just crash, some games do nothing. But there are a couple that do interesting things. Rescue, for example, from Mastertronic, when you press the break key, you got the boot screen of a, is it a Tartung or Tatung Einstein? Yeah, I think it's Tartung Einstein. Tartung Einstein, which was, <laughs> which was good. The other one is Colony from Bulldog. And if you press break on that, you get a Commodore 64 boot screen, which is also funny and a sneaky poke at the Commodore users. However, not you can't use them. They're not they're not there to do anything. They're just It's just a representation. If you press any key, it goes back to the game. So. What I'm, oh, I was going to say, what happens if you accidentally press break? <laughs> And then you enter a Commodore screen you can do nothing with. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe that maybe that's a sort of double dig, so you can't do anything with the Commodore. But anyway. My favourite has to be Booty, though. The little extra game that you get in Booty, oh, which I always you, thought was quite a nice touch. When you plug the... Is it Karas Beach? You, you plug in. Yeah. Oh, you, it does that. Yeah. Oh, you can put a pork in. You can put a pork in if you haven't got a Karas Beach, and that gives you yeah, that little 
what is it? It's, a, it's booty swimming under yeah. underwater, isn't it? It's the game's kind of reminiscent of Scuba Dive by Jarrell. You kind of just yeah, you just swim along and collect fish. And when you collect enough fish, you go back to the menu, the main game menu. Oh, does it go back then, so you can actually get back that way? But you have to play yeah. the game to get back, right? Okay. Yeah, you do. It's fairly easy, but I mean, it is it is another game. It's a game that you can almost imagine being a one ninety nine Microsoft game. Um, Microsoft. <laughs> Microsoft. Yeah. <laughs> Mastertronic. Mastertronic. <clears throat> yeah, one ninety nine Mastertronic game. And given this right. was a this was a two ninety nine. It wasn't Mastertronic. It was Firebird, wasn't it? Game. Then it's mm. having it. It's a brilliant game anyway, and having an extra game in it. I mean, that's a that's a really big Easter egg. There are a couple of other games that's got mini games in as well, according to that list. You've mm. got Short Circuit that's got two mini games in. However, you can't just get to it by pressing keys or poking. You've got to go to a room, look at a, download some software, search a drawer, pick up a pass, go to another room, and all that sort of yeah. stuff. But you do get a mini version of uh, Fruit Machine and a mini version of Space Invaders. And then there was um, Zub, yeah, what which, was... had, which had Light Farce. Which is a, which, a good poke game. at Light Farce. Yeah. <laughs> Um, however, I, I've been trying to get that, and I can only get it to work on one to eight K emulation, not plus two or plus three. Only I can only get it to work on the one to eight K emulation. Oh, that's interesting. Which has also got a silly message in the high score table, which says a game in an afternoon. So it looks like they wrote that in the afternoon just to alleviate the boredom. Well, there are often quite a lot of things in high score tables, weren't there? If you put a certain name in, you got something else. Everything yeah, from ru- yeah. rude words to well, if you put a rude word in, it would change it to something else. <laughs> A lot of the design design games do it. Mm. Dark Star does it, that sort of thing. And of course, in Valhalla, if you said a rude word, you got... You, you got, got a slap. You did, you got a slap. <laughs> Talking of design design, two mini games in the Forbidden Planet. One of them is a Space Invader game, and it's easy to get to. Uh, you just hold down zero when loading. Hold down the zero key when loading the game, and you can get that on an emulator. Mm. And you get a nice little Space Invaders game, and then also during the game you hold down one, two, and three, and you get a strange game called Wino Hunt, <laughs> <laughs> which, which having played for about three seconds, you it moves a little cursor around, and then something eats you. So I don't know what's going on there. I didn't have enough time to get to get familiar with that particular game. Anything else? Anything else notable? Mercenary has a Commodore logo in it, doesn't it? It does, and I found that. It took me a while to get to those, to figure out how to get to that particular coordinate, which is 1304. There is a Commodore logo, and if you shoot it, apparently a message comes up and says, good show. However, by the time I'd found it, the ship I was in had been destroyed, so I couldn't shoot it. But okay, what else have we got? We've got Midnight Resistance, the music test, which is fun because you can get to listen to all the different parts of music by uh, when you go to Redefine Keys... You put in your keys, and when it says, um, are, you okay, uh, are you happy with this, yes or no, you type in, we want to hear music, and you get a music test page. Actually, I mean, maybe typing 6031769 into Manic Minor counts as an Easter egg as well. <laughs> There's lots of people remember that number. It must have been put in as a test mode, wasn't it? It must have been put in to, like... You would have thought so. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, that's it. That, that about wraps it up. It does. If anyone knows of any Easter eggs, really good ones that we haven't mentioned, please leave a comment. A comment, and make sure that they're not already listed on the web page that I'm linking to. There's a, there's a red herring in one of the Wally Week games, isn't there? But I, I actually think it has a use. The red herring, the red herringness of the red herring is a red herring. <laughs> okay, we'll stop there then. Yep, definitely <laughs> stop that. <there. This is Proteus by Abacus Programs, released in 1983. You have to reach the enemy planet to destroy it, flying through 20 quadrants, with each quadrant containing 12 sectors, all full of aliens and debris. You have to destroy their transmitters and clear a path through the debris, from left to right, to allow your battle fleet to follow through, wipe out the enemy aliens and complete the game. When I first played this, I immediately thought it was a bad Asteroids clone, but soon discovered it was a bit worse than that. The game idea is good, but the control and chase mechanic of the other ships makes this a terrible game. 
You can rotate, thrust and fire, just like asteroids. You can blow up rocks, just like asteroids. But then there are the other ships on screen too. These also rotate, thrust and fire randomly until they are in a direct line with you, with nothing blocking them. And at this point they just charge straight towards you, firing constantly. This ends up with you being destroyed, despite holding down the fire key to try and destroy them first. If you do manage to destroy the other ships, you can jump to other parts of the map. However, this usually sees you being dumped right in the middle of more aliens that will instantly kill you. And in this aspect, it's a bit like blasteroids. You can also fly off the screen into the next sectors, again, only to be met by other ships. There's no chance to line up shots. The other ships just simply lock on, charge and fire. I tried to play this three ways. Firstly, I tried to sneak up on the other ships, but as soon as you get near, they just rotate, shoot and kill. Secondly, I tried to charge them, firing constantly, and this ends up with you being destroyed again. And thirdly, I use the guided missiles. Here you fire a missile, and then using the same controls as your ship, guide it to its target. This seems to be the most successful way, but the enemy ships quickly rotate and destroy the missile anyway. All very frustrating. There's no skill involved here. There's no plan of action that will see you being successful, and there's nothing you can do to survive. It's a frustration-inducing, jerky game that you should avoid. There is a free game with it called Alien Pit Rescue, and this is just a typing game. You control an android that has to rescue miners in a slowly flooding mine. You have to pick them up one by one and take them back to the surface, with the miners at the bottom scoring more points. The mine slowly floods, and you have to be careful not to make contact with the water. You can, if you get stuck, blow vertical paths in the rock, but you only have eight of these charges to use. It's a dull, terrible game with laggy key presses that doesn't even bring the whole tape anywhere near sellable quality. The best thing about this whole package is the inlay, which is really nice, and I think that's the best thing I can say about this. It's about time we looked at some Spectrum demos. I love these things. They push the little machine to the limits. The first one is Mega Demica 4K. Yes, all of this in just 4K of memory. It takes a while to load and decompact, but it's definitely worth it. It has some great music by Gasman, and although in monochrome, the graphics are very entrancing. A nice one to start with then. And next we have Karataka by Joke. After some text, we get the real demo, and the animation is great, so many different moves. The music complements this demo really well, yeah, hammer time! Great demo to watch over and over again. The next one is called Cube, and this is supplied on a TRD disk image, so you'll either need a beta disk interface and drive, or Div IDE with Exidos, or an emulator that supports it, something like Spectaculator. Once you get into the demo though, it has a really nice effect, and great music. The 
The only thing bad I can say about this is the flashing border, which really does get on your nerves. See what I mean? Just for you, I've hidden it, so you can enjoy the demo without getting a headache. This is another demo that you can watch over and over again, and it's really impressive what these coders can come up with. There are a lot more demos out there for you to have a look at. Go check them out, and if you find any worth looking at, let me know.